you do need to keep official meeting minutes. And this is uh, for the democratic functioning of things. This includes board meetings and member meetings. Uh, it also includes your um, executive committee, which is a, a subset of your board of directors that a co-op can have to allow you to make some of the administration decisions on an ongoing basis. Um, and committees will often keep minutes, and that's a good idea because it provides a way to report on decisions or recommendations that the um, that the uh, committees are making and provide that information to the board. The, the staff may have meetings as well, and it's not required that those are minuted, but it may be best practices for that information to be minuted. Um, contrary uh, to, to some belief, minutes don't have to be verbatim, and they don't have to be an entirely detailed record of who said what at a meeting. And in fact, I would argue that that is against your best interests. At a minimum, you have to record the decision that was made in the vote. You have to capture the democratic process at members' meetings and board meetings. But you want to do a highlight of the discussion and the decisions. And you may also want to keep copies of agendas and, and accompanying material in addition to the meetings, uh, the meeting material in addition to the meeting minutes uh, as records. Um, and part of this is it's also it's exhausting to keep verbatim minutes or to try and capture every nuance of every discussion. But the reality is when you get to a board meeting, especially, or a member meeting, there is likely to be a lot of round and round discussion about a particular issue before you get to a place of, of making a motion or deciding on a particular issue. And it can be counterproductive to keep all of that information in your minutes. Um, so you know, highlighting with a few key decision points or a few key discussion points around the crux of the issue can be very useful because you know, for a director or a member that may not be present, it allows them to get a flavor of what the discussion was about. But it's also uh, a lot more manageable. And the one thing that's not on here that I want to mention briefly is this idea of in-camera minutes. In-camera is a, is a portion of your board meetings where it's a confidential part of the meeting. And uh, most, this is not uh, legislatively covered in the Corporate Corporations Act, but it's a part of, of General Roberts Rules procedures, which is how most co-ops run their meetings. And they use modified Roberts Rules. Um, but in-camera sessions are, you see that if you ever watch your municipal council meetings or anything like that, the council will go in-camera. And it's to consider things that are sensitive. And that usually means um, where, the, where the board may be receiving legal advice or needs to discuss a legal issue or needs to discuss employee issues. They will go in camera. And if that's the case, everybody needs to get out of the room except the directors. So you know, if you've ever been in a municipality, they clear the gallery. It's the same concept for the board of directors. And it's a very good idea for the board, although you know your senior employee may be there at every meeting, it's important that the board has that space to do an in-camera session so they can talk about things like performance evaluation of their staff person or employee issues without that employee being there. Um, and, that, and that's just good practice. So uh, you do have to make a motion to go in-camera. It is, it is possible for the board to keep in-camera minutes, but they are kept separate from the other minutes that happen at that meeting. And they, those in-camera meeting minutes generally are kept under lock and key in a separate place. And because they're considered part of the board meeting, they're not accessible to members, and they're not accessible to anybody but the directors. So uh, that can be a very important thing to protect the confidentiality and to allow uh, sensitive discussions to happen in a, in a reasonable way. Um, and um, I think the only other thing I'll mention about Robert's rules is um, most Robert's rules indicate that you introduce a motion on the floor at your meetings, and then you discuss it, and you make any amendments to the motion that you choose, and then you vote on it. Most cooperatives I've seen, and, and because you're not required to follow Robert's Rules under the legislation, you know, this is a, um, Robert's Rules is really a guide. Uh, this is a, a, something that I agree with and find it much more practical for the type of decision making that happens in a cooperative is you introduce a topic for discussion, like you know, we're going to talk about the development of the project. Uh, you know, say it's a renewable energy co-op, you're going to talk about the project status. Um, you talk about what's happening with it, you have some discussion, and then a motion comes out of that, or the chair will have some sense of what decision needs to be made as a result of that discussion. So you do the discussion first, then you make a motion, and then you vote on it. 
and this for those co-ops that follow a consensus decision-making model, uh, this is a much more useful way to approach your agendas and minutes. Um, and this, and this is also can be a very useful way to discuss, uh, to approach member meetings as well, because it allows the members to, to discuss. And for those members that may not have experience with Roberts rules, following a formal Roberts rules procedure can be quite intimidating in terms of allowing for <coughs> free flow discussion. But then it's important that if you're following this a more modified procedure, that your chair uh, of the meeting uh, is good at keeping the discussion on track, uh, so that the freeform discussion does not get completely out of hand. Uh, and, and you know, this is it's certainly colored by my experience in the cooperative movement, and I'm sure others have had other experiences. So if you have comments or questions about uh, good record keeping or minutes or agendas, please feel free to share. So maybe uh, if people have comments online. Yeah, there is one. Yes, uh, we have a question, or two questions from Jean online. Mm -hmm. Are membership lists just names of members or contact info as well? And are membership lists and meeting minutes to be kept indefinitely? Ah, uh, member lists include contact information as well as name, and that's because uh, when mem when the board has to send out notices for meetings, uh, you can do that by email. But if you choose to do it snail mail, you need some sort of contact information to get to those members. Um, and the question was about keeping them indefinitely. Yeah, there, there is no uh, information in the Act around, there's no legislative requirement to keep things for a certain number of years. Um, when it comes to financial records, I have heard that uh, seven years is sort of considered best practice for your financial records. Um, that would be something where I would encourage you to check with your financial advisor or your accountant about how long they're expecting you to keep your financial records, because there are audit implications in terms of Revenue Canada, may uh, you know have the ability to go back a certain number of years, and so that would probably be your best practice. Um, but there, the member list, I would argue that you would keep uh, in perpetuity. You you may not. This would be one reason to be moving from uh, to have a corporate minute book that changes from year to year, and you would archive old books. So you may not need to know who was a member. Like for example, uh, Gay Lee Foods is 50, 52 years old or something. This year. you don't need to know necessarily who were the members in 1950 for any sort of governance purpose. From a historical purpose, it's great to have that information. So you would sort of move that out of your your archive. So it's you know there's no requirement for you to keep those. Issues unless, uh, <coughs> excuse me, those members still own shares that have not been redeemed. And if that's the case, you need to keep that information around so that you can pay those members back if they leave. So um, with member stuff, I would argue, you know, you don't necessarily need to to be keeping it unless there's a financial ramification around share payback or loan payback. Um, with meeting minutes, it's you know, you you, you wouldn't want to throw them out after six months. Um, but certainly, you know, you don't necessarily need to be keeping meeting minutes uh, going back 75 years necessarily. 